let us prepare our hearts and minds as we remember the sacrifice which was given to us in love and in mercy. Because if we truly look at our lives and examine our hearts, we did not deserve this. But because of God's love, and because of His mercy, He sent His Son to make that ultimate sacrifice for us. And though we take of these emblems every week, we are reminded of why we gather here and why we do this in remembrance of our Savior. Let us now prepare to take the bread and let us pray. God, Heavenly Father, we are thankful to come before you, thankful for your Son Jesus and sacrifice which he gave to us. We know that it was not easy for you and it was not easy for your Son. But we do this in remembrance of you and as we take this bread which represents his body, let us again be reminded of his sacrifice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And as we continue, we know that Christ gave his body, but we know that also he shed his blood on the cross. And usually at this time of year, we don't think about that sacrifice because we think about that innocent babe that came to earth. But we know that that babe grew up to become a man and to spread the word of God so that we have opportunity to go to heaven and to be with him when our time on this earth is ended. So again, as we are about to take this fruit of vine which represents his blood, let us go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we humble ourselves as we come before you. We are thankful again for your son's sacrifice and this precious blood that was shed upon the cross for the remission of our sin. And as we take this fruit of vine which represents his blood, let us again be reminded of the sacrifice let us take it in matter which is pleasing unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so this is the last lesson I plan to uh, do in this series, for now at least, because we will have covered all of what we call the Sermon on the Plain. Not that we could ever cover all of the meaning and the implications of of these or any of Jesus' teachings, but I hope that we've at least been able to focus on some things that maybe we've missed in the past, um, and I'm sure you will see things that I've missed as you read these words in the future, because that's the way the Bible works. You don't ever get it all and just go on to the next verse. But uh, you go back and you go back and you go back and you find new things as you do that. So let's begin by backing up to the setup that Luke gives and reading all of Luke uh, 6, Verses 17 through 49. We're going to read all 32 verses of this sermon because it's not as long as the Sermon on the Mount uh, that you see in Matthew. But these are the first direct teachings of Jesus that we find in Luke's Gospel. He's already taught by example and he's taught by demonstrations and follow-up words and all uh, of that has been very powerfully demonstrated uh, you know, in the authority that he has. So, you know, so far, he was baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit descended on him. He was tempted by the devil after fasting for 40 days. He was teaching in the synagogues and being praised by everyone until he went to his home church. And they tried to throw him off a cliff. And he showed his authority after that. He just walked right through the crowd. But he showed his authority over evil spirits also who possessed people. He healed lots of people. He called his first followers to follow him. Uh, he heals a man with leprosy, showing his authority to turn uncleanness into purity. He heals a paralyzed man to show his authority to forgive sins, because he first says, your sins are forgiven, and then to show my authority uh, to do this, he told him to pick up his bed and walk. Um, he calls a tax collector from the, the most hated uh, class of Jews, 
And he also eats joyfully with others who are known as sinners. He makes a point of eating and drinking happily in contrast to the Jewish religious teachers and uh, even John's followers who fasted a lot uh, to call on God's, uh, to call God's attention uh, on all of the suffering that was, that was just a part of Jewish life at that time. And then he even declares himself to have authority over the Sabbath. The Sabbath was their basic religious law. They were told to keep, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. They weren't to work on that day. It was a day devoted to reflection on their, uh, the way that God had loved them and cared for them. So all of this is in the two, the two and a half chapters that start after the story of his birth and John's birth, the, the, the John the Baptist, his cousin, and the one and only story about his childhood. There's only one story about Jesus' childhood when he was 12 years old, and it, it occurs in Luke's Gospel. And after all of this, he takes 12 of his followers up on a mountainside to pray. And he chooses 12 of them for a special mission, which is what an apostle means, one who is chosen for a special mission. Uh, and so he comes down to a level place. And that's the plain. And this is where he gives these teachings that we've been looking at over the last seven weeks. So let's start there and focus in, concentrate on these th 32 verses in Luke chapter 6. Where are we? <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's start again. Verse 17. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of, these, of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming out from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestor treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repa repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. 
For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? How can you say, whoops, <laughs> Uh, you hypocrite down in the middle first take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye no good tree bears bad fruit nor does a bad tree bear good fruit each tree is recognized by its own fruit people do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. Remember, Jesus was a house builder. He was a carpenter himself. So he's describing what he knows about. And he knows that they know that he knows about it. It's all right. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Now we're going to look at a clip that tells a bit of history about a canyon that, that I've driven through. My wife and I now have driven through hundreds of times. I started driving through it on the way to Tehachapi when I was preaching here for a year and was coming up, you know, three days a week. And uh, it's the San Francisco Canyon. You may have tried to, you know, stayed on the, the freeways, but the shortest route by about 15 or 20 miles is through the desert and this canyon. And uh, so this is a bit of a history, though, about this canyon that we've driven through hundreds of times. Uh, it's about 30 miles south of here. It begins a few miles past Quartz Hill. And uh, in 1928, there was a dam constructed there by William Mulholland. You heard that name because he was the engineer who designed and completed the California aqueduct that uh, diverted a whole river to bring water to Southern California, to LA specifically. And so uh, listen to where this story begins in the middle of this after the dam was built. Located 45 miles north of Los Angeles and San Francisco Canyon, construction of the St. Francis Dam began, an ambitious but tragic project. The dam opened in May of 1926, just two years after breaking ground at the site. She stood 205 feet tall and 150 feet thick at its base. It carried 12.5 billion gallons of water and was two and a half miles long in length a one-year reserve of water for the city of Los Angeles. It was March 12, 1928, and things began to take a turn for the worse. Dam keeper Tony Harnischferger calls Mahalan with urgency, stating there was dirty water running through the dam's crest. There was a new leak on the western abutment, um, and it was showing it was muddy, and that means that it would have been undercutting the dam, which could lead to the failure. One of the many warnings that Mahalan didn't find alarming. Later that day, two minutes before midnight, dozens of workers at Powerhouse One wake up after hearing a crash echoing through the canyon. St. Francis Dam had failed. Twelve billion gallons of water were released, a wall of rushing water standing 125 feet high, destroying everything in its path, all the way to Ventura. They called us and told us that the dam had broken and everybody came over to our house and they were all sitting there discussing 
Well, it cannot possible. It's only been completed for about a week. No, no way. And so the men said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go out and drive up along the river and see if we see any water coming. <laughs> and Dad said they stepped outside and they could hear it coming. And our nearest neighbor, who was half a mile away, came up, woke us up, told us what was going on, and all four of us, mother, dad, my sister, and myself, went out and listened in the middle of the road, just listened to the roar. Farms and ranches were either heavily damaged or destroyed while entire homes were lifted off their foundations. Over 7,000 acres of agricultural landscape were destroyed, including citrus and walnut trees. Livestock were either swept away or drowned trying to escape their pens. Unidentified bodies were found as far as Catalina Island and San Diego, and entire families were consumed by the floodwaters. There were many accounts of what happened, including Henry Ivan Dorset, whose sister, Lillian Curtis, and her husband, Lyman, were living at Power Station 1, just down the road from the base of the dam break. She recalls the water clipping at her ankles, soaking her nightgown, while rocks and dry weed were bruising and cutting her bare feet in the pitch black of night. She looked down to see if Lyman had made it. He was gone, along with her two daughters, Maisie and Marjorie. And when I run over to the car, why well, here's my sister in the back seat, it was a sedan. And when I opened the door, she started to cry and she was saying, Ivan, this is all that is left of my family. The leading theory for the collapse is that the foundations were unsound. On solid bedrock, the dam would have been perfectly safe, but it was built on permeable ground. So the weight of water held behind the dam started to seep through and soften the ground under it. There had always been a couple of cracks in the dam that was normal for the time. Concrete can do that as it sets, but more had started to appear. Leaks were starting to grow. Mulholland and his assistant inspected the dam and decided that it needed maintenance, but the situation wasn't desperate. Well, maintenance couldn't have helped. The dam was 12 hours away from collapse, but evacuation of the areas below could have saved hundreds of lives. William Mulholland was devastated by the tragedy and took full responsibility for the dam's failure and paid in total $5 million in response to the victim's claims. He lived the rest of his life in seclusion. The St. Francis Dam collapse is considered the worst man-made civil engineering disaster of the 20th century, claiming the lives of more than 400 people. They actually don't know how many people died. <clears throat> because there were a lot of migrant workers who also lived in that valley that goes from Santa Clarita all the way to the ocean, uh, who you know, weren't even recorded as, as being there. So, um, we get the point. No matter how magnificent a structure may be, and maybe that didn't look so magnificent to us in black and white, um, but in that day and age, it was quite a magnificent structure. But if it doesn't have a solid foundation, it will eventually fail. It's not a matter of if it will fail, it is a question of when. But here's the thing that we need to ask when it comes to Jesus as the foundation. What is the foundation and what is the structure that is built on the foundation? Now we might think that all of the things that Jesus is doing all of the authority he has shown, that would be the foundation. Wouldn't it seem like Jesus' power over nature would be foundational? Well, it is essential, almost like a foundation. I mean, why would anyone not follow him when he demonstrated what seemed to be absolute authority over biological illnesses, over injuries, over handicaps and even over spiritual forces that exercise control over physical bodies. And yet not everyone who saw those miracles did follow him. The thing that seemed to concern Jesus the most, however, is not all uh, not is that not all of those who did follow him, you know, they followed him physically, but they followed him because of his authority over nature 
And yet not all of them submitted to his spiritual authority. And for us, that should be our foundational commitment. So this is what Jesus has laid out in these 32 verses. These are his teachings. These represent his spiritual authority. The foundation of our relationship with God is obedience to these teachings and how we treat other people. That is the foundation. Love is the foundation. Now, if we submit to baptism in Jesus' name and say all the right words and come to church and sing the songs and take the communion and pray the prayers, that is the structure. Religion is the structure that's built on the foundation. Now, during Jesus' ministry, there is, a, is very little doubt that the vast majority of those who witnessed Jesus' miracles wanted Him as their leader. Uh, in that sense, they wanted to follow Him. The only exceptions were those who had some authority of their own, you know, like the Jewish religious leaders, the Roman government authorities, and others who saw His authority as a threat to their ambitions. But the majority wanted Jesus as their leader. However, the majority of those who wanted him as their leader did not necessarily want to follow him when it came to his teachings. Mm -hmm. We can be very religious and we can claim Jesus as our hero and hear his words and even memorize his words without putting them into practice. Now, is the structure important at all? Well, yes, it is. In fact, one of the major mistakes that led to the collapse of the St. Francis Dam was at the very top. The original design called for it to be 185 feet tall and 150 feet thick at the base. You saw those steps, it got narrower as it went up, but at the base it was 150 feet thick of solid concrete. The extra pressure, uh, what, what happened though, is they wanted to increase the capacity of the lake. And so they added 20 feet at the top. The problem was they left it only 150 feet thick at the base. The extra pressure that added around the, the dam, uh, that, that 20 feet of, of water that was two and a half miles long, and I don't know how wide, but it added all of that weight, all of that pressure, and it is believed to be one of the factors that led to the soft walls of the canyon being undermined and washed out. So would it be possible to attempt to put all of these words of Jesus into practice, but build a flawed structure that would undermine our lives because they are, it's a structure that does not fit on that foundation. Well, think about this. Almost every philosophy that claims to oppose Christianity or be better than Christianity seems to be somewhat motivated by the idea uh, that uh, the Christian religion and people who call themselves Christians are not as loving and giving and tolerant of others as they think we should be. So they come up with these other philosophies. In some ways, they're right. We are never as much like Jesus as we should be. We fight a lifelong battle of wills, pitting our own spirits against the Spirit of Christ who lives in us. But these other philosophies usually don't even know that they are saying that we should be more like Jesus. Because the structure that they have built on the foundation of Jesus' revolutionary teachings about love, it was very revolutionary at the time, gives credit to someone or something else. See, their actions may be Christ-like. They may be loving. They may be forgiving. They may be not judgmental. They may be merciful, like our Father is merciful. But they don't acknowledge our Father. Their worship, if they worship, may honor some other god or gods or teacher uh, in some cases, it just honors themselves. So, if, that, if it didn't matter what the structure was, 
then, you know, the Beatles song would be right. You know, all, all we need is love. Well, the world is a better place if more people behave like Jesus, regardless of who they glorify. That's, that's a fact, you know. If everybody loved, no matter who they gave the credit to, the world would be a better place. However, if they're not worshiping Jesus, they have built a structure on that foundation that is not designed for that foundation. Uh, a non-religious example is Marxist communism. You know, many of the ideas are based on valuing and sharing with anyone who has need. Like Jesus said, everyone who asks receives and is never expected to give anything back. That's the idea of socialism, communism. But because the structure they have built on that foundation does not honor God or recognize Jesus as the only one that we can trust, the caring ideas morphed into authoritarianism where everyone is forced to be what they think they should be and what was supposed to honor the common man became and still becomes the most oppressive and murderous philosophy that has ever existed. Millions of common people's lives become a necessary sacrifice to the cause. A religious example within Christianity might be any church or denomination or organization that exercises authority over congregations and individual followers of Jesus. What inevitably happens is the church becomes more important than its members. So if someone has a moral failure that embarrasses the church, rather than forgiving that person and loving that person, he or she is sacrificed for the sake of the church or the organization, or in some cases it's the victims who are sacrificed uh, when these things were done in the name of the church. Uh, but an example of something that happens in our circles where we don't have churches that have authority over us is, is a Christian college, a school that I loved and because I grew up there, went, went to it, my father worked for it, but they had a strict rule against students drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, kids could be expelled for doing so. And I'm not sure whether there was a written rule against the faculty drinking, but it was understood, of course, that they would not make it look like there was a double standard, so none of the faculty drank, uh, in public at least. But some students saw a couple of faculty members coming out of a bar in the next county, the county that the college is in is a dry county. Can't even sell liquor there. Uh, but this county wasn't a dry county like the one the college was in. These guys weren't drunk. They had just been fishing and they stopped in at a bar for a couple of beers. You know, uh, but they were, they were seen by a student. And uh, they were, of course, called on the carpet by the president of the college. Now, one of the men just sort of packed his bags and looked for another job. Uh, the other man asked to speak to the student body at their daily chapel and he humbled himself and he apologized profusely and he asked for forgiveness. And he did the same thing at the church where most of the college students and uh, most of the employees attended church. Was he forgiven? Well, I'm sure everyone said that they did forgive him. But they fired him mm. from his job. And his PhD was no longer put to use when the only job that he could find was selling insurance. Um, so what was the thinking of the Christian men, particularly the president, uh, who was you know, the administrator of the college that they called a Christian college or a Christian institution? Well, I never heard a direct answer. I was just a high school kid. But I knew the way they seemed to think about such things. The thinking was that the reputation of the college was more important than any one person. If they really forgave him and acted out on that forgiveness, then they might have to forgive students who made the same mistake. And they would have to explain to students and parents you know, of those students who were expelled for the same offense why this man was able to keep his job, you know, and they were all kicked out of school. And lots of them had no doubt asked for forgiveness for mercy, but we're kicked out anyway. Too much forgiveness 
would set a bad precedent. Well, you might say that he was forgiven, but he still suffered the consequences of his sin. You know, that certainly often happens when we come to God asking for forgiveness. Just because he forgives us doesn't mean that we don't suffer consequences. He doesn't, you know, miraculously remove all of the people who are mad at us or restore marriages when legally we can't even remarry. But there are greater and lesser consequences for some sins, right? So being humiliated and answering to his own family would still have been consequences. He would have suffered even if he had been, you know, kept his job or his job had been given back to him later. It just seems to me that we are never going to know the exact best thing to do for all who are involved in any situation that involves sin. So should we possibly show too much compassion and hurt someone that way? You know, that's certainly possible to do. You can hurt someone by showing too much compassion. Or should we possibly be too harsh and do our part to make the consequences so severe that they'll never think of doing such a thing again? Well, we run a risk either way. There's the risk of leading them to think, that wasn't so bad. I'll just be more careful not to get caught the next time. They'll forgive me the next time if I do. Uh, then there's the risk of crushing them with shame and making them think that they're some kind of second-class Christians who are not worthy to be on a level with others. So the question is, is that the way God forgives us? Do you think that if Jesus had to deal with specific cases that he would have said something like, love your enemies, but don't trust them? You know, trust but verify? Isn't that in the Bible? No, that's Ronald Reagan. Sorry. But forgive those who sin against you, but don't put yourself in a vulnerable position with them. Well, don't you think that since we're never going to know the very best thing to do, that we should lean toward looking like we're too merciful rather than too harsh. Hmm. Okay, so those who thought that they had forgiven that college teacher but didn't let him keep his job or allow him any chance to ever return to his job thought that the institution, the Christian college, was more important than any one person. And so in that case, the college was the structure that was built on this foundation of love. We called it a Christian college, but the structure did not fit on the foundation of love and forgiveness. It had to stand in judgment without mercy. In my opinion, that actually indicated that the school was not built on the foundation of Jesus' teachings at all in this instance. It was built on a foundation of worldly wisdom. They did the wise thing for the institution. And in fact, Here's an irony. The school proudly proclaimed Jesus as Lord, it was, as Lord and in fact had this verse car carved into the limestone wall of the building that we called the Bible building because every student was required to take Bible classes every semester and most of them were in this building. So can you read what is written on that wall? You might not. It says, Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Maybe you haven't noticed, but sometimes churches do the same type of thing. A, a, a couple of college students, when I was doing campus ministry in Montana, they got sexually involved before they were married, and she became pregnant. So they walked down the aisle, confessed to the church, asked for forgiveness, and then they made plans to get married. Now, at the time, whenever anyone would get married, you know, I would make a big deal of it in my bulletin articles. They were kind of newsy, notesy articles at that time. And so I made a big deal of their marriage in my bulletin article. And one of the elders said that I shouldn't have done that. Their marriage should not be treated like the marriages of others because they had made this big mistake. We wouldn't want the other college kids to think that what they had done was no big deal. Uh, people used to be, you know, encouraged to come forward at church if they had sinned, any kind of sin. But usually 
the wording, if they gave any wording, if they came forward and, and were confessing their sins, was that they had sinned and brought reproach on the church. That was the most common line. Sin and brought reproach on the church. Now the Bible does say to confess your sins one to another. Nothing wrong with confessing your sins to the church if you have brought reproach on the church. But that verse was the verse that was used to try to get people to come down the aisle and, and uh, confess their sins. Uh, I don't, if you want to do that, that's great. But that's not what the Bible says that you must do. Uh, but we must confess our sins one to another. All right. But <clears throat> um, in my opinion, when we encourage this line, sin brought reproach on the church, uh, that actually indicated that uh, we believe that the church should not be built on the foundation of Jesus' teachings at all. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not that line, but the elders' opinion that I shouldn't have uh, treated their marriage like everyone else's. Uh, the elder believed that the church should not be built on the foundation of Jesus' teachings at all in that instance. I mean, he was all about love <laughs> uh, in his words. Uh, but he believed in that instance that it should be built on a foundation of worldly wisdom. Now, we as individuals are being warned by Jesus himself in this lesson to not just hear his words, but to build our lives on that foundation. That is foundational. So let me ask you honestly, do you see anything in Jesus' words that would indicate that we are saved by being a member of this or any church or any institution? Is the church or some other institution or some body of teachings the foundation? No. Uh, well, then does that mean that we're wasting our time and money and energy here? Is this not important at all? Well, if we only had these verses and none of the rest of the story, we could come to that conclusion. However, we do have the rest of the story. By the time Jesus said this, he had lots of followers, all of these teachings, and that last line. And he had just chosen 12 of them to go and make other followers, to be witnesses to what they had seen him do and heard him teach, how they had seen him live his life. And so when they finally did that, this is what happened. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Sounds a little like communism, but it was not authoritarian communism. They did this because they wanted to be together. They sold property. They weren't forced to. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. No man or men can add or subtract any other person to or from the church. They may pronounce a judgment. They may be able, be able to enforce some worldly uh, consequences. Uh, but maybe one of you had one of those fathers who said, I, I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it. Uh, you know, I hope he was joking uh, when he said that. But the truth is that only God can do either of those things. And that goes for the church as well. The Lord is the one who saves us and adds us to his church. And he is the only one who can take us or anyone else out of it. But here's the thing. If we are saved, the Lord has added us to his church. We need to be a part of his church. Why? Well, so that we will share with each other and encourage each other to put Jesus' words about love and mercy and forgiveness into practice. That's why we're here. Let's pray together.
Our Father, we thank you that Jesus didn't just come and say words, uh, that he didn't even just come and do uh, things that showed his complete authority over all things. Uh, that he didn't even just come and uh, sacrifice his life, but he told us that we should sacrifice our lives and show our love and mercy and forgiveness toward others and showed us how to do it. Father, we just pray that we will be better at doing that, that we will remember that that is what we're all about, and that when we see someone else who is caught up in a sin or we know someone in the world who has some crazy ideas and philosophies that we will be merciful as you are merciful and that we will uh, do that in Jesus name as we pray in his name amen so we're going to sing a song this time with uh, with the video so let's stand together and we're going to sing uh, about the foundation now this song is one of the few about how Jesus is the foundation. Stand up together. Um, but think about this. If you listen to the words carefully, it really doesn't go into the words that Jesus was teaching. It, it, it's talking more in theological terms, how he is the foundation of our, our faith and our belief and, and the sacrifice that was made for us. It's about redemption, uh, and that's, that's a good thing. But uh, I want you to add to that in your minds, uh, first of all, that... Uh, his teachings, the foundation he was talking about when he talked about himself as the foundation was um, love and forgiveness and mercy. Righteousness alone. 